As a boy, he watched his family destroyed by war. As a man, he became a member of his military's secret service. Now he's been sent to America to track down an international weapons cartel haunted by memory. Driven by rage. You killed your father, man. He's a trained assassin who's uncovered a deadly conspiracy that's about to become his personal target for revenge. When I was a little boy, I had a hard time falling asleep. I tried to imagine what my life would be like when I grew up and had a wife and children. And beyond that, to my grandchildren and great-grandchildren, would the world even exist that long? And what would happen in a thousand or million years? Maybe the whole world would be destroyed and there would be only nothingness. I thought and I thought until I hit an impasse, the unknown. Then I would think about the world before I was born, my parents' lives before they met and had a family, and further back, before my grandparents, and then back to the creation of the earth, the sun, the moon, and the stars, and before that, when everything was only nothingness, just air and gas and all kinds of chemicals. I thought and I thought, again arrived at the impasse of the unknown. And finally, inevitably, I stopped thinking and fell asleep. I grew up in a warm, traditional family. Aside from deep thoughts about the universe, I didn't have any special fears or worries. My parents worked hard and focused on one all-important goal, the raising and the care of the family nest, the best way they knew. Life was simple and straightforward, like nature, which interested me more than anything else. The beach, the crashing waves, the rain, and the puddles I love to jump in. I loved spending time with my grandfather, who, although he had become blind at a young age, was always happy with what he had, didn't complain and put his trust in God. I liked listening to his stories about the old times, each with a clear moral lesson. Be good to others, fight for justice, and always trust God. For me, God existed, but very vaguely. A kind of a father who lived up in heaven, perhaps, far and unreachable. But to my grandfather, God was real and tangible. Someone he prayed to, praised and thanked for everything in his life. In high school the party started. We started dressing and behaving according to the prevailing norms and fashions. All our dreams and aspirations rose or fell according to what we saw on TV and in the movies. It seemed to us that movie and rock stars were the happiest people in the world. It was during this time that I decided to one day fly to America and become a famous movie star. As soon as I got out of the army, I was off to New York. New York was invigorating, the hub of the universe, the land of unlimited opportunity that makes you feel small and insignificant and big and powerful at the same time. It's impossible to shake the feeling that you're living in a 24-hour movie, except for one small difference. In the movies, the screenplay writer always makes sure the ending is good. Real life's a lot tougher. To succeed at anything, you need to work hard. In New York, that's a million times truer. I took a variety of jobs, at the same time steering myself in the direction of my American dream. I studied acting and filmmaking, went to auditions and quickly discovered that New York is full of endless number of beautiful and talented people from all over the world. 
they all have the same dream to be a star. A couple of years passed and I'd had some success and earned some money. I bought a nice American car, partied, ate out and lived in a fancy building with a doorman. In short, my dream was coming true. But the reality was not that rosy. I began observing my surroundings with greater attention and realized that all these people, or at least most of them, weren't happy. The opposite was true. They had this constant need to go on vacation, to relax, to get out and party. If someone's happy, why would they have this never-ending need? What I wanted, what we all wanted, was to be really living and enjoying our life all the time, not just occasionally. And this wasn't possible. Suddenly I realized that we were all stuck in the infinite vicious circle of chasing fame and fortune, wanting to be important, admired and adored. But truth is, we were all very lonely, myself included. Meanwhile, I kept pursuing my dream, and finally, after many long and exhausting years, I got my foothold in the movie world, starring in a typical American action movie. Lots of guns, helicopters and fighting. received an invitation to a film festival in Hollywood. My dream was coming true. When I discovered that most of the key people there were businessmen lacking any real artistic knowledge, my disappointment was huge. The people deciding which movies show in Israel, England, France, the whole world, don't consider the influence the movies have on the education of the viewers or the substance of the plot. What's important to them is which star they can get for the movie and how many violent scenes there will be. In short, how much money the movie can make. As always, money and only money is the name of the game. These were the people who molded the dreams of my youth. These are the people who mold the dreams of millions all over the world. So I'd had a dream. I wanted to be like all these famous people. Except I forgot to check out whether it was worth being like them. Were they really as happy as they always looked on TV or in the papers? Or were these just the smiles they kept for the photographers and their fans for us? I forgot to check how they behaved in the families, how they behaved as human beings. I forgot to check the number of divorces, the number of affairs, how many take drugs, and the percent involved in fraud and embezzlement. I was blinded by the dazzle and forgot what my grandfather had once told me. Look not upon the vessel, but at what is in it. Before buying clothes or a car or apartment, I do research so I don't blow it and end up taking a big loss. But for this item called my life, I didn't research anything. I just went with the flow, with the fashion. Yes, my parents and my teachers educated me, and also my neighborhood friends to a lesser degree. But weren't they also influenced by the mass media? They also watched TV and read newspapers. When I took a closer look, it became clear that we are all victims of the decrease of fashion determined by those in the film studios, the TV stations and the newsrooms who have the power of the media at the fingertips. They hold by force the most powerful influence that has ever existed, steer public opinion as they will, and influence us all, for good or for evil. They use specialized advertising methods 
to sell us certain product, to convince us which juice tastes better, which movie is worth seeing, which public figure is more trustworthy. Everything. They control our decisions and influence us every inch of the way, without us realizing it. But all in the name of democracy, the name of freedom. Freedom to know everything. Freedom to hear and to see. The freedom for each person to destroy himself and everything around him. And what interests them more than anything else are the ratings, the percentage of people who spend money. This realization hit me like a bomb during that film festival. The thoughts raced through my mind like a flash. I felt ashamed. But above all, I felt an overwhelming sorrow. Sorrow for all those who had, like me, been deceived. Sorrow for all those young people in New York, Tel Aviv, London or Moscow who are learning from people with no moral limits or breaks, who through the media are influencing our lives. It's no wonder that we've become constantly craving profit and reward. It's no wonder the world's crime rates are consistently rising. Due to the vast number of shocking news stories, we've become used to hearing things that a generation ago would have heard about once a year. Robberies, murders, suicides, divorces, destroyed families, children growing up without love, family values and morals. We have become an ugly and corrupt society. When I returned to New York from Hollywood, I knew. The life I'd been living was completely erroneous and rotten to the core. I had to change direction. The questions from my childhood returned to nag at me. Why are we here? Is everything by chance? Should we just eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow we die? And if there is a purpose to our lives, what is it? What's right and what's wrong? I dropped everything and embarked on an information quest. Information is worth its weight in gold. Throughout my life, I've been exposed to many different kinds of information and learned new things. Most people are unable to change or to be changed because they are fixed in their opinions and aren't open to new ideas that oppose the old ones, dismissing unwelcome information with negative labels, brainwashing, prejudice, superstition, etc. I believe that it's the right, no, obligation, of every person to examine every kind of information to help formulate as much as possible an objective opinion regarding the world in which they live. Since I'm a thorough person, I began examining every detail closely, collecting as much accurate data as possible from qualified people. Before beginning my search, I knew I had to start with the belief in God, the faith which above all characterized my grandfather and always gave me the strength to overcome obstacles and go on. Everyone, knowingly or unknowingly, no matter who they are, turns to God in times of trouble. Even the top doctors sometimes throw up their hands and say, only God can help them. This then was my starting point. Is there a God who created the whole world as it says in the Torah? And if so, for what purpose did he create us? When we see a cup, we understand that someone made it. The cup didn't suddenly create itself. If a space mission from Earth arrived on some planet far away and found a CD player, no one would claim that it must simply have come into being by itself. Every scientist would see it as evidence of civilization. Something or someone on that planet created that machine and the search would begin. Who and where is the creator? When I look at the existence of the world in which I live, and at the ingenious and brilliantly ordered way in which the world functions. It's impossible not to be impressed. Whoever created this world must be very sophisticated. How could it even enter my mind that this was all the result of an explosion? Explosions destroy things. They don't create them so perfectly. A good friend of mine took me to a meeting with a world-renowned specialist who was visiting New Jersey. 
I will never forget that meeting and the vast amount of knowledge that I gained about the workings of the human body. The brain is made up of thousands of millions of nerve cells. Every cell has between 10,000 and 100,000 nerves making contact with all the cells in the brain, exactly like telephone and electrical wires that conduct information back and forth non-stop without mistakes. The overall number of connection wires like these in the brain is about 10 to 15th power. Imagine all the phone and cable companies in the world within the brain of one person, functioning beautifully without problems. How could I possibly think that this came about on its own? Under a sophisticated microscope, I saw a living cell whose size was something between a hundredth of a thousandth of a millimeter. I was shocked. A typical human cell contains tens of trillions of atoms, yet, with all our scientific advancements, we still haven't come close to understanding a single cell, not to mention its creation. In the world of science, everyone agrees that one cell is many times more complex than the world's most advanced computer. And from one single cell comes a perfect baby, with its blood flowing in the proper amounts, a heart, kidneys, and the brain. The animals, the birds and fish, all created from one single cell. With all of today's scientific advances, no one has yet managed to create a fly. No one has actually created life from nothing using any kinds of chemical, organic, or other substances. And I'm not talking about cloning or IVF, which simply copies something that already exists. The most advanced fighter jet in the world doesn't even come close in performance to that of a fly or mosquito. And this is only the tip of the iceberg of our amazing world, which left me astounded after my in-depth examination. But one question continued to plague me and gave me no rest. Is the world made up of only what is detectable with our five senses? Or is there something beyond them as well? Up until a few years ago, scientists only dealt with hard facts, things that could be detected by our five senses of sight, hearing, taste, smell and touch. Today, science enters the world of supernatural. To my surprise, I discovered a wealth of scientific research about people who are living in the present but are able to relate and prove who they were and what they did in a previous life. About 30 million people around the world who have experienced clinical death testify in different research papers about their experiences following death. We didn't והוא סיכם איתנו שהוא ייצור איזה מין סחרחורת קלה לרוב, לכל האנשים, היינו משהו כמו שמונה, כדי לזמן את כולם באותו ערב לבוא לסיאנס. מה אתה זוכר מהדקות שמגיעות אחרי הצמיחה? התחלתי לראות מה שמתרחש מסביבי, אבל כאילו אני צף מעל. נמצא מעל התמונה, אני רואה את עצמי שוכב. אני רואה את החובש מנסה לעשות את ההחייאה. אני רואה אנשים מתחילים להתאסף מסביב, אני רואה את הבלגן. אני חושבת לעצמי כמה מוזר שאני רואה את הגוף שלי, כלומר אני לא בתוך הגוף, כי אני הייתי, אף פעם לא חשבתי שהגוף ואני זה משהו נפרד. or think it was me. And now that seems very unusual, but while it was happening, it's, it was totally natural to look at it that way. Then the light became brighter and brighter, and it turned to a pure white light, radiant, beautiful light. 
And I knew I was in the presence of God. אני פתאום הרגשתי שאני רואה את מה שאף פעם לא האמנתי שבכלל יכול לקרות, קרה או עשוי לקרות, זה שלרגע באמת ראיתי תמונות של ההיסטוריה של החיים שלי עד גיל 21, רצוף, מהר, באמת דומה לסרט, בצבעים מאוד חיים, וככה זה נמשך וזה היה מדהים. בתוך הסרט הזה יש כל החיים שלי, מהיום ש... נולדתי עד לאותו הרגע שנפלתי ברחוב. אני מתפלאת על הזיכרון החזותי המופלא הזה, שמישהו תיעד אותו. כלומר, מישהו צילם אותי והקליט אותי כל, כל החיים, כל מה שעשיתי. אני הייתי כל כך מסוגר לנושא הזה, כל כך, כמו שהגדרת קודם, מרובע, סגור בתוך עולם של נוסחאות ושל מתמטיקה, שלהוציא אותי מהדבר הזה הייתי צריך שוק רציני. היחס שלך למוות השתנה? ההבדל הגדול הוא שקודם לכן מוות בשבילי היה סוף פסוק, mm-hmm. אין שום דבר אחר כך. אחרי אותו אירוע, ועם כל מה שלמדתי, עם השנים שחלפו מאז, אני מבין שזה רק התחלה של דברים. 8 מיליון אמריקאים קלאים שהם עברו את הנרדת החיים שלהם. P.M.H. אטווטר, אוטור של קומינג בק לחיים. 8 מיליון אמריקאים. And that may well be an understatement, since a great many people are reluctant to talk about their experience. לפני שלושה חודשים הוא עבר תאונת דרכים קשה ונזרק לצד הדרך. המחלצים כיסו אותו בסדים, משוכנעים שמצא את מותו בתאונה. הנה, באולפנינו בתל אביב. שרון נחשוני, איתנו עכשיו. שלום. שלום וברכה. אז מה, זה באמת, אפשר רק כמעט לומר, ברוך הבא מן העולם הבא. נכון? כן. אני פשוט אה, מאבד את ההכרה תוך כדי התאונה. אה, שני חופשים מגיעים אליי, לא היה לי נשימה, היה לי קצת דופק, עזבים אותי והולכים לשאר הפצועים. היה קול טוב שלא ראיתי אותו, הוא לא דיבר המון, היה קול רע, והקול הטוב הזה פשוט אמר במפורש דברים טובים שאני עשיתי. I am usually a very rational person, but it was hard for me to ignore the fact a person is a combination of physical and spiritual, and there certainly is a spiritual power, something supernatural overseeing this merger of body and soul. The truth is, it's certain the world has a creator, and I think everyone knows deep down there's a force that created them. Just look how the earth And the sun and the moon always remain in their orbits at the same average speed, as if some mysterious motor is powering them. If everything was by chance, the sun could suddenly change direction and would freeze from the cold or burn up from the heat. How is it that it always stays in the same path and moves at the same pace? Somebody's got to be running the show. My problem wasn't that I didn't believe in God. I didn't want to believe. It annoyed me to think I was just this little nothing and there's this higher power above me that I can't understand. It bothered me to think there's someone I'm accountable to for everything I do, whose rules I have to live by. This was just annoying. I wanted to be free to do anything I pleased without anyone telling me whether it's right or wrong. My biggest difficulty, and I think everyone else is, we know that such perfect and sophisticated creation has to have a reason, a purpose, but we are clueless as to what it is. So we just shove all those thoughts to the side and go on with our daily grind. Get up in the morning, eat, work, sleep, and do the same thing over and over again. every day. Why don't we ever stop a minute and ask ourselves the most important question of all? Socrates, Plato and Buddha all asked this question, but someone had already searched for and discovered the world's creator thousands of years before them, Abraham the Hebrew. Back then, when Abraham discovered God, Most people didn't take him seriously. He needed to buck societal norms and butt heads 
with the idol worshipping ruling majority. And although they mocked him and tried to kill him, he kept fighting for the truth. Today it's impossible to ignore the fact that Abraham is the spiritual father of most of the world's inhabitants. Abraham's gift to his descendants, the belief in one almighty God who created and continues to oversee his creation every moment, today constitutes the definitive act of faith according to the three major religions, Judaism, Christianity and Islam. And then, 3,300 years ago, about 500 years after the divine promise Abraham received, his descendants, the children of Israel, experienced the most wondrous event in history of mankind. God took them out of slavery, led them on a miracle field track to Mount Sinai, and appeared before them when he gave them, through the hands of his servant Moses, the Ten Commandments and the Holy Torah, which constitute the basis for the entire Bible. From elementary school on, I always loved Bible class because the stories and the moral lessons we learned from them were so gripping. But I never thought of the Bible stories as having really happened. They seemed like legends, that's all. One of the necessary steps in my journey, therefore, was to delve into the holy books of the Jewish people, the Bible, the Talmud, the Zohar and others. To my amazement, I discovered an inexhaustible treasure trove of fantastic and irrefutable scientific evidence that, despite the passage of time, only made stronger the claim that the Torah and Judaism were not merely another man-made religion, but indeed divine. One of the facts which astounded me the most dealt with the number of stars in the universe. Until approximately 400 years ago, it was almost universally believed that the number of stars in the universe was around 6,000, because that was the number visible to the naked eye. In 1609, Galileo, using the first telescope he'd invented, saw that there were a lot more stars in space. And with each successive technological advance since, scientists have discovered more stars. Until at last the US succeeded in placing a giant telescope in space and with it arrived at an unimaginable number of a one followed by 18 or 19 zeros. The Talmud, written by the sages of Israel 1600 years ago, tells us something astounding. In Tractate Berachot, page 32, we find a detailed explanation of the structure of the heavens which are divided into different galaxies. It then concludes by stating that the total number of stars in the universe as revealed to the nation of Israel 3,300 years ago is a little more than 1 and 18 zeros. This is almost exactly the same number arrived at by science today with all its modern technology. Unbelievable! Another discovery, no less fascinating, was the length of the lunar cycle. In Tractate Rosh Hashanah, page 25, the Gemara relates that the time between new moons, according to calculations made by Rabbi Gamliel, is 29.53059 days. Thousands of years later, after they had landed on the moon and were able to carry out exact calculations and measurements, NASA's chief scientist published the results, stating that the time of the lunar cycle is 29.530588 days. A more advanced research done in Berlin came up with the result of 29.530589. That's a one-tenth of a second difference between science and Rabbi Gamliel, the leader of the Jewish people 2,000 years ago, who testified that this information came to him in a direct line of transmission back to Moses, who received it from the Almighty Himself. My source for many more scientific discoveries was the Zohar, written by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai about 1800 years ago, while hiding in a cave from the Romans, and upon which all Kabbalah 
is based. The Zohar tells us that Earth is round and revolves on its axis, something proven by Columbus only 500 years ago, that there is a magnetic force which makes it possible for people to walk around on all sides of the Earth, that there are seven continents, including North America, that the weather in different parts of the world has an effect on the outer appearance of the people who live there, that when one half of the Earth is in sunlight, the other half is in darkness, and that there exists a place where there is only one hour of nighttime, today known as the North Pole. Many more scientific revelations and prophecies that came true in later generations had been written thousands of years prior by the sages of Israel who testified that everything they knew had been learned via the direct line of transmission going back to Moses and God himself. Since I always had a strong love for the land of Israel and its history, I was pleased to discover that there are many archaeological finds that support and prove everything written in the Bible. The remains of Noah's Ark, discovered not long ago in the Ararat Mountains in Turkey. The altar that remains on Mount Ebal, which corresponds exactly to the altar described in the Book of Joshua. The Cave of the Patriarchs in Hebron, a place of pilgrimage for millions from around the world the grave of the matriarch Rachel, the holy city of Jerusalem, the western wall, one of the remnants of the temple, which was the house of God, the place that connected man to his creator. The archaeological find that amazed me the most was the Ipovar papyrus, discovered in an archaeological dig in Egypt and acquired in 1828 by the Leiden Museum in Holland. Papyrus has been translated into several languages and reveals amazing testimony written by an Egyptian about the ten plagues that God brought upon Egypt, exactly as described in the book of Exodus. What surprised me the most were the discovery of hidden codes in the Bible. A research team headed by the well-known mathematician Professor Eliyahu Reeves of the Math Institute of the Hebrew University typed the Torah into a computer with no spaces. They then programmed skips at equal interval between letters and found names and words connected to different historical events. The chances of randomly finding numbers of words corresponding to the same subject in the same section with the smallest skip intervals are nil. The research by Professor Reeves proves that in the Torah it is very possible. How is it possible that a book written more than 3,000 years ago could contain hidden evidence of events that only appeared in yesterday's paper? The Twin Towers, the assassination of its Rabin, AIDS, Ilan Ramon, death in the Columbia Shadow, and more. We are seeing here that I am looking at it in a different way. The thing is that I am going to go to the next one, and the next one. ועוד שמת בדיוק מתחתיה בשורה הבאה, תו. עכשיו, מכיוון שאורך השורה הוא 36 שטיות, ולכן כשאנחנו סופרים בתורה 36 שטיות, זה בדיוק מביא אותנו לתו שמת מתחתיה. עוד פעם 36 שטיות, מגיעים לא' וכן הלאה. למשל, כאן המילה התואמים, ההופעה שלה בדילוג 36, זה די הדילוג הכי כתב בכל התורה. אתם רואים כאן אות מ. ממ עד ט, כמה יש לנו? בואו נראה, יורדים אחד למטה, זה יהיה 36, שלוש אחורה, זה 33, זה יצא מילה מטוס, בדילוג של 33 אותיות אחורה. גם כן רואים כאן מילה הפיל בדילוג 39, מטוס, הפיל, 
מגדלי התאומים פעמיים. היו אמנם דברים שמי שהצליח, הצליח לצפות אותם, לצפות אותם מראש, זו הדוגמה הכי מפורסמת, זה רצח של יצחק רבין, שהוא בעצם התגלה על ידי עיתונאי מרק גלדרוזני, אז הוא בא אליי והראה לי את הטבלה הזאת, כלומר שרואים עליה הופעה של מילה יצחק רבין, זו הופעה יחידה של מילה יצחק רבין, דוגים שווים בתורה, והוא מצא שזה עובר במקום שכתוב הרוצח אשר ירצה, והדרך שהוא פירש את הטבלה הזאת, ש... יש כאן פרדיקציה או תחזית או אזהרה על אפשרות של רצח. אז הוא לא הסתפק בזה, הוא אדם פעיל, כתב מכתב לרבין, כתב מכתב לגורם ביטחון בארץ, ואם זה אזהרה צריכים להזהיר. אני מזכיר שרצח רבין אירע בסוף 95', כלומר שנה וחצי לפני שזה אירע, הטבלה הזאת הייתה קיימת. one of the world's greatest mathematician and Nobel Prize winner, said, Rips' results are significant, at least at the level of one in hundred thousand. You just don't see results like that in ordinary scientific experiments. The Bible codes are facts. When I read through the Bible, I was struck by the elaborate descriptions, open miracles, the people of Israel experienced over the generations. Detailed accounts of the exodus from Egypt and the splitting of the Red Sea, proofs of which, such as Ipover papyrus, have been discovered in archaeological finds in Egypt. The giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai, which took place before the entire nation of Israel, as well as the converts from other nations, who alone numbered between three to six million people. Millions of men, women and children, who saw the voices, the fire and the smoke during the giving of the Torah from the Almighty, creator of the world. To make up such an event would be impossible, as millions of witnesses would be able to verify or deny it. And it's a fact that no Jew or any other person in the world has dared denying the giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai until today. The same holds true for the miracle of Moses hitting the rock. producing enough water for all those millions. For the manna, the food that fell from the sky for 40 years in the desert, for the earth swallowing Korach and his followers, and many other open miracles that took place in front of all Israel. And not only in the time of the patriarchs and the exodus from Egypt did open miracles happen, but during the thousand years they lived in the land of Israel as well. In the days of King Hezekiah of Judea, in the year 3213 of the Jewish calendar, 547 BCE, King Sennacherib of Ashur and his army laid siege to Jerusalem to destroy it. King Hezekiah ordered the temple's Torah scroll brought to him. He spread it out in front of the Holy Ark and together with his people prayed to God throughout the night that he should save them from the hand of this cruel enemy. When morning came, all 185 officers of the army of Ashur were found dead. And this story is verified by archaeological finds written in the language of Ashur. Miracles take place even today, but we tend to be so intent on the pursuit of our personal desires that we fail to notice them. Nineteen sixty seven the six day war. I was still a playful little boy running around the empty streets of Tel Aviv. The situation in Israel was so frightening that people were preparing to leave the country. Everyone was certain that the Arab armies would throw us into the sea. The mighty armies of Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, and Morocco had joined forces against the young army of tiny Israel. The country created only a short time before, following the Holocaust that wiped out more than a third of world's Jews. Within six days, all the Arab armies had been defeated. 
and not merely defeated, but they had also suffered significant territorial loss. In six days, an absolute open miracle. Nineteen ninety one The Gulf War. I was a film student in New York and could only watch on TV as thirty nine Iraqi scout missiles scored direct hits on densely populated areas of Israel over one month. Thousands of ceilings fell in. Whole neighborhoods were destroyed and not one person was killed by the missiles. Not one Jew lost their life. My landlord, an Italian-American, told me, it's a miracle. God really loves your people. It's unbelievable. And to put in perspective this miracle's magnitude, a single Scud missile fell on a U.S. Army camp in Saudi Arabia near the end of the war killing 12 soldiers and wounding tens of others badly. As a boy, I loved reading. I read anything I could get my hands on. Now, in my personal journey of discovery, I began to read as much as possible about religion and science. To my surprise, the only book that throughout history had dared to publish significant prophecies was the Bible. For more than 1,000 years, the prophets of Israel delivered prophecies which, though at a time defied all common sense and logic, have all come true. What is the meaning of the word? As the human being is not the human being, the human being is not the human being, like the human being. דבר שתורת ישראל מדברת עליו כבר אלפי שנים, והמדע המודרני כיום הולך וצועד ומגלה. אנשים כאלה, עוד בהיותם כאן בעולם הזה, התחברו בשעות מסוימות עם הכוח העליון, עם בורא היקום, קיבלו ממנו מידע, וזוהי בעצם הנבואה. The prophets of Israel prophesied many times in great detail about the destruction of the temple and the exile, events which only happened many years later. This was also true of the prophecies foretelling the dispersion of the nation of Israel to the four corners of the earth and the great suffering that they would endure because they had left God's Torah and His commandments. But the Torah also promises us that despite all the murder and persecution, the Jewish people will exist forever. <laughs> הרי לנוכח כל השמדות, הפוגרומים, העינויים, הטבח, הקהילות השלמות שנשרפו ונטבחו, עם ישראל היה צפוי להיגמר מזמן, ואכן במרוצת ההיסטוריה היו תקופות שהן הצד הטובח והן הצד הנטבח חש בבירור סוף היהודים הגיע. ובכל זאת, למרבה הפלא, עם ישראל שוב צומח, מתנשא, מתרבה. History books, among them the book of Josephus, describe the land of Israel before the destruction of the temple as lush with rivers, forests and green mountains. However, the Torah promises us that should the Jews go into exile, the land of Israel will become a desolate barren desert, a land of swamps and rocky ground. And that is exactly what happened during 2,000 years of history. During the years of exile, the temple was destroyed and burned to the ground twice. Many nations fought over Jerusalem and destroyed every precious inch of it. The Midrash reveals a prophecy concealed in the Song of Songs, assuring us that despite all the disasters that come upon Jerusalem and the temple, the Western Wall will remain undestroyed forever. The Zohar reveals to us that in the year 5600 of the Jewish calendar, roughly the beginning of the 19th century, the Creator will rain down intelligence and wisdom on the world at a dizzying rate. Glance at any encyclopedia since the 19th century, 
more scientific progress has been made than throughout the entire rest of history. And today, inventions and discoveries happen daily. The prophets of Israel had also foretold something equally illogical and against all odds. At the end of the days, the people of Israel would return from every corner of the earth to the promised land, the ingathering of the exiles. And they are promised that this creation of a Jewish state will be sanctioned by the world's nations, as we witnessed in the famous United Nations vote in 1947. <laughs> Prophet Ezekiel tells us that with the return of the Jews to their land, it will once again begin to bloom and flourish. The trees will bear fruit, and the desolation will give way to green fields. Step by step, the land will return to what it had been, a land of flowing with milk and honey. The Prophet Jeremiah describes the Gulf War in great detail more than 2,000 years before it happened. He tells us that a coalition of countries to the north of Babylon, Iraq, will come to fight using innovative new missiles, smart missiles. The Maldim, a Torah commentator who lived 200 years ago, explains that this refers to intelligent missiles that arrive at their target by themselves. Jeremiah lived at a time when the Babylonian Empire ruled the world, but he did not hesitate to proclaim that in that future war, Babylon would be soundly defeated. The Bible promises us that after Israel's return to its land, there will begin an era of return to the commandments of the Torah. Thirst for the Word of God will increase not only in Israel, but throughout the entire world. This is a divine process which we have been witness to over the past 20 years. There is an important principle in Judaism, where a person really wants to go, that's where heaven will lead him. You want to be in a movie? You'll be in a movie. You want money? You'll get money. You want the truth? You'll get the help of heaven in finding ultimate truth. And that's what I experienced during my searching. I ended up at all kinds of fascinating lectures, meeting deep spiritual people who, like me, wanted to discover their purpose and how to live their lives in a more moral, ethical and better way. During this period of time, I remembered a dream I'd had about five years earlier, several months after the death of my beloved grandfather. A very strange dream engraved deep in my memory. I saw my grandfather sitting as usual in the yard next to the tree, sitting and praying. I approached him slowly, and suddenly he looked up at me with a frightening look and said, Prepare for the end. And I walk with a start. At the time, I was an NYU film student, a graduate of acting school, and busy with auditions and my dreams of Hollywood. Although the dream had been very real, I hadn't understood what he wanted from me, and pushed it away as though it had never happened. And now I understood. I understood it all. What had happened in the last century is not just coincidental. The world is in turmoil. Wars, Holocaust, Jews returning to Israel, worldwide terror, natural disasters, crime, and moral deterioration on a scale the world had never seen before. The world is terrified of the unknown. And now I understood my grandfather's message in that dream, as the sages of Israel had prophesied thousands of years ago. We are standing right at the very end.
הנני מביא אותם מארץ צפון, וקיבצתים מירכתי ארץ, בם עיוור ופיסח הרע ויולדת יחדיו. האלוקים מתחייב שיום יבוא והוא יקבץ את עם ישראל מהמקומות הנידחים ביותר בעולם, בדורנו, עם התגשמות נבואת קיבוץ הגלויות, כאשר מטוסים נוחתים בזה אחר זה, הרי רואים שאכן הכל יתגשם. באותה תקופה נאמר שארץ ישראל תיפתח ותפרח לאחר שנות שממה רבות, ואכן העולים החדשים שהגיעו לכאן פגשו קדחת, מלריה, ביצות וכדומה, והנה כיום שדות מוריקים, ארץ ישראל פורחת, פרדסים, שווקים מלאים כל טוב, ועל זה נאמר ביחזקאל פרק ל"ו, ואתם, הרי ישראל, ענפכם תיתנו. ופרייכם תישאו לעמי ישראל, כי קרבו לבוא. וכך אומר הנביא עמוס, הנה ימים באים נאום השם, והשלכתי רעב בארץ. לא רעב ללחם, ולא צמא למים, כי אם לשמוע אל דברי השם. נערים ונערות, צעירים וצעירות, מבוגרים, זקנים וטף, התעניינו ביהדות, יעשירו את ידיעותיהם הרוחניות. והתקרבו לאלוקים. ועל כך כותב הרמב״ם, כל הנביאים כולם ציוו על התשובה, ואין ישראל נגאלים אלא בתשובה. וכבר הבטיחה תורה שסוף ישראל לעשות תשובה בסוף גלותן, ומיד הן נגאלים. בתלמוד במסכת סוטה דף מ"ט נמצאת רשימה של סימנים של תקופת הגאולה. בעקבות המשיח, לאחרית הימים, חוצפה תזכה. יהיה הרבה חוצפה בעולם, ויוקר יאמיר, אינפלציה, המלכות תהפך למינות. יהיה שלטון, אבל שלטון עם אופי זול, אופי של כפירה שנוגדת רוח היהדות. ואין תוכחת, יהיה קשה מאוד להוכיח אדם, אתה מוכיח אותו במקום שיתבייש, ישיב לך בעזות, אתה תתחרט שפנית אליו בכלל. ואנשי הגבול יסובבו מעיר לעיר ולא יכוננו. אנשי הגבול אלה אנשים שנמצאים בגבולות, כלומר חיילים, במקום להיות בגבולות, יסתובבו בתוך הערים, ולא יכוננו, לא ירחמו עליהם, יכו בהם. וחוכמת הסופרים תסרח, חוכמתם של תלמידי החכמים תחשב כבזויה, גם כאן בניגוד גמור להיסטוריה היהודית שעם ישראל כיבד את תלמידי החכמים שבו, ויראך את ימאסו, התדמית של הציבור הכללי שומר המצוות, תהיה תדמית מאוסה. והאמת תהא נעדרת. ילדים יגדלו מבלי לדעת את האמת. לא יודעים מאומה על הישארות הנפש, על יסודות היהדות. נערים פני זקנים ילבינו, גדולים יעמדו מפני קטנים. בן מנבל אב, בת קמה באימה, כלה בחמותה. אויבי איש, אנשי ביתו, פני הדור כפני הכלב. והבן אינו מתבייש מאבי. עזות פנים נוראה תהיה באותה תקופה, מנבאים חז"ל, צריך לזכור אז לנסות להיכנס לאווירה של אותה תקופה, לצורה שחיו בה באותה תקופה, ולהבין עד כמה הדברים שהיו תמוהים אז, התגשמו היום עד פרטי פרטיהם לנגד עינינו. וכך אומר הנביא יחזקאל. ויהי דבר השם אלי לאמור, בן אדם, שים פניך אל גוג, ארץ המגוג, נשיא, ראש משך ותובל, והנבא עליו. ממשיך הפסוק ואומר, מימים רבים תיפקד. באחרית השנים תבוא אל ארץ משובבת מחרב, מימים רבים בעוד הרבה זמן. באחרית השנים סמוך לקץ, זה הזמן שלפני הופעת המלך המשיח. תבוא אל ארץ משובבת מחרב, ארץ שהיו בה הרבה מלחמות. מקובצת מעמים רבים, לאחר שהתקבצו אליה מהרבה עמים, על הרי ישראל אשר היו לחורבה תמיד. היו לחורבה, ובשעה שתבוא כבר לא יהיו חורבה. פריחת ארץ ישראל, קיבוץ גלויות, זה הזמן של מלחמת גוג ומגוג. The world we live in is very mixed up. We find ourselves chasing after nonsense and trifles, forgetting that we have a Father in Heaven 
who worries about us, who directs and supervises everything in our lives. And like any father who loves and educates his children, our Father in Heaven gave us a book of teachings to help us conduct our lives and ensure that the whole of creation runs in the best possible way. With tolerance, love and sensitivity to the needs of every creation on earth. The Torah, its name means teaching, a book of laws, sometimes rigid and strict, sometimes appearing irrational from the perspective of our small human intelligence. But looking deeper, we discover that the human race couldn't possibly be run more efficiently. Throughout the generations, numerous nations, cultures and empires treated us cruelly and tried to destroy us, but didn't succeed. Despite all attempts to obliterate them, the Torah and the Jewish people stand firm. The Torah of Moses is unique and eternal for the simple reason that it's not just some other book written by human being. It's an astounding book given to us by the Creator of the world Himself, containing His instructions to us, His creations, on the best way to conduct our lives. אני ממערכת החינוך הממלכתית, בית ספר עממי ותיכון ברמת גן, יצאתי עם מה שקוראים תפיסת עולם אבולוציונית. בהחלט החדירו לנו את הרעיון שהמדע יכול להסביר איך הכל נהיה במקרה, ושבעולם שלנו אפשר להסתדר יפה בלי הקדוש ברוך הוא. ואני גדלתי על זה שהמדע זה שיא השיאים של האמת. ברור לחלוטין ששם מצויה כל האמת כולה. אני הייתי בקונגרסים בינלאומיים. אני הכרתי את כל גדולי העולם בתחום הפסיכולוגיה ובתחומים אחרים. לא חיפשתי יהדות. לא ידעתי מה זה יהדות. בשבילי, בשבילי דתיים היו כמו אסקימוסים. כמו אסקימוסים. לא ידעתי מה הם עושים בכלל. כשהכימיה של החיים התפתחה במקרה, ושהחיים התפתחו במקרה, ואחרי זה החיים השתכללו במקרה, תפיסת העולם הזאת היא לפי דעתי מוטעית לחלוטין, אין לה שום בסיס מדעי. יתרה מזאת, אני כמדען מתקומם על כך שהצליחו לטמטם את האנושות בתפיסת העולם הזאת, מילאו את האנציקלופדיות בדברים שאין להם שום שחר ושום בסיס מדעי אמיתי. אני, יהודי דתי, שומר תורה ומצוות, אני מאמין בריבונו של עולם. אני לתורה מגיע עם הרבה מאוד שכל והיגיון. אנשים שמתבוננים בכימיה של החיים, בצופן הגנטי, והם טוענים שזה מקרה, או מנסים לתאר איך זה נהיה במקרה, האנשים האלה, אני מגדיר אותם כמאמינים פנאטיים במקריות. באבולוציה אין צורך להילחם. היה אולי צורך לפני 50 שנה, היום אין צורך, מפני שכל אחד שיודע, אבל באמת יודע עד העומק את המצב באבולוציה, יודע שהאבולוציה היום כבר לא קיימת. בשנת 81, 1981, שלושה אלף אבולוציוניסטים בשיקגו בעצם הגיעו להחלטה כתובה שדרווין בהחלט טעה. אם אין כוח אינטליגנטי שמסדר את העולם הזה, אז אולי צריך לדבר כזה, שהעת הזה פעם כל ככה, פעם ככה, מה פתאום שהוא ייפול כל פעם אותו דבר? 
אותו דבר עם החוק הגרעיני, עם החוק האלקטרומגנט, עם כל חוק. חוק עצמו מעיד כאלף עדים שיש מחוקק. יש הרבה מאוד מדענים ברחבי העולם שמכירים בהכרח שיש כוח עליון. אני נפגש איתם ברחבי העולם, אתם צריכים לדעת שמי ש... יש דיסאינפורמציה גדולה מאוד בציבור לגבי מה בעצם המדע אומר. איינשטיין, גדול המדענים בכל הדורות, האיש שקיבל את, את התואר, איש המאה ה-20. היום איינשטיין נתפס כהמדען מספר אחת, בוודאי במאה האחרונה, אם לא יותר, ולא הייתה לו שום שאלה, הוא היה מגחך כששאלו אותו אם יש בורא לעולם, לא הייתה לו שאלה בזה. כל יהודי שיש לו מספיק אומץ לעמוד מול האמת, יוכל לשאול את השאלות ולקבל את התשובות ולהגיע למסקנות ההכרחיות שעם ישראל חי. ושהקדוש ברוך הוא אמת ותורתו אמת, והדרך היחידה שלנו בעצם לבנות את עצמנו כיהודים ולהביא את עצמנו לגאולה אמיתית ולחידוש הקשר הישיר עם הקדוש ברוך הוא זה דרך, רק, אך ורק דרך העשייה התורנית, דרך שמירת תורה ומצוות, דרך לימוד התורה. לי קוראים הרי אני בן ישראל ואני בן ישראל ואני בן ישראל אני סטודנט במרכז הבינתחומי בהרצליה לממשל דיפלומטיה ואסטרטגיה ואני חוזר בתשובה של הרב עצב. האמת היא שבתיכון המקצוע שהכי פחות עניין אותי זה היה מקצוע תנ"ך. ובאמת, אני מציע לכם לפחות פעם בשבוע לקרוא בגמרא כי זה דבר מופלא. אני באמת אגיד לנו בורא עולם שנתן לנו הוראות איך לחיות, איך להפעיל את גוף האדם. מדובר על מלחמה של כפירה מול טהרה, מול קדושה, מול אמונה. שבבוקר אני הולך ושומע דברי כפירה נגד השם, נגד התורה, נגד היהדות, מהבית ספר, מהמורות. ואחרי צהריים, ברוך השם, במרכז הרוחני אור האמת, ששם אני שומע דברי קדושה שמתאבים אותי לשם ולמצוות. ונותר לי רק לאחל את כולכם באמת שתזכו להתקרב לשם, כי זה הדרך הכי נכונה. The conclusion for me was clear. The dream I had sought so far away was actually in my birthplace, the eternal holy land of Israel. I was flooded with good memories, the great weather, the warm people who had come from every corner of the earth, just as the prophecy said they would, who struggled and transformed swamps and barren desolation into a fertile, blossoming land. Israel. This wonderful place where those in need will always find aid. Such a small multicolored place, the whole world in miniature. Golden beaches, deserts, waterfalls, mountains and valleys, the flowing Jordan River, the Sea of Galilee, snowy Mount Hermon, and above all, Jerusalem, the city of gold. My return flight was more emotional than ever. Even at the airport, it was impossible not to feel the overwhelming warmth of what's really one big family. But while I'd been away in exile, the whole country had changed. Simple roads paved into huge concrete highways. Modesty and simplicity had become towering office buildings, expensive sports cars and glitzy malls. The land of Israel like the rest of the world, had overwhelmingly adopted the American way. But the seeds of disaster had been sown along with the modernization. Divorce and crime rates are up. Violence and drugs have reached gigantic proportions. And as one who is looking from outside in, it's hard to escape the impression that the people here are also part of the global race for honor, lust and money. living lives devoid of any real purpose, meaning or goals. The land of Israel, my country, my birthplace, has fallen prey to the false American dream. Now I am struggling with the reality, day by day, hour by hour. Cautiously but decisively, I am trying to clear the road of potholes. I am trying to follow the path Moses paved for us, the Divine Torah, although I am swimming against the current of modern life. I am trying to be a good Jew, to love all humankind, no matter what religion, culture or customs they follow. 
And most of all, I believe, expect, and wait longingly for the time that the Almighty will fulfill His promise and bring world peace to all of His creations speedily in our days. Amen. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah. 